Um, either way, um, I'm on uh, uh, unceded land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations uh, in Melbourne. Uh, others may be joining from other locations as we are gathered virtually, which is great. Um, if you'd like to, uh, mm -hmm. anyone who's here today, put their notes in the chat. We wel welcome that. Um, uh, and I'm sure um, uh, Kashmir feels the same way. We pay respect to the traditional owners and custodians of the lands in which um, we are all situated today, wherever you may be, um, and recognise that sovereignty, has, sovereignty hasn't been ceded um, and pay respects to any um, Aboriginal people who, uh, who may be joining us today, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. Thank you, Kashmir. Did you... Um, do you like me to introduce our presenters? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'll put uh, a link in the chat just because we have um, we have Dr. Chin Nguyen, and hopefully I've pronounced your name correctly. Please uh, feel free to correct me. Excellent. And Associate Professor Dawn Gilmore joining us today. Um, I have the pleasure of not having directly worked with Dawn, but being a very uh, good professional and personal colleague of hers. And um, both of them have recently written a book, Partnering with Online Program and Just Distance Education. Uh, I've put a link to that in the chat. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity to hear their thoughts around uh, learning design in the context of OPMs, as well as um, any key takeaways from the, their recent book. So I'm going to... Put it over to uh, Dawn and Chin um, to further introduce themselves if they would like. Uh, I know that both have been in the space in, um, you know, in various institutions and OPMs for a number of years. And so uh, I'm sure they will give us some great insights today. And it's great to have you both here. Thanks, Kate. Um, <clears throat> we're happy to get going if everyone else is. Um, we've um, brought together just a presentation on some of the setup we did to do this work. It's an edited collection. Stephen Ablett, who's in the room, has a chapter in it. Um, but I'll hand over to Chin to get started and I'll be running the slide. So can I confirm everybody sees a big white slide? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kate, and thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dawn, uh, for your introductions as well. So, so Dawn and I are very happy to be here and share with you, um, you know, the topics that we'll be talking today. So give a bit of a background on the topics, and, and we'll work on with you the two useful framework uh, for university decision maker to understand what approach might be best for the institution. Um, these two theoretical framework uh, we draw on a lot in terms of all of our uh, research, as well as some of the, um, you know, the way that we select the contributor uh, for the uh, for the book as well. Uh, 10 operational approaches between university and OPM relationships or partnerships. Um, that's how we, we have researched and we found this, this 10 models uh, in there. And finally, uh, which is about what is that, what does that mean for learning design and for the future direction in these areas um, as well. Thanks, Don. Uh, so, um, okay. So then, uh, what is a university OPM partnership? So what we're talking about today are online program management companies that join forces with universities to design and run online courses for, um, we were asked by our publisher to call it distance education because this is for the a US market. Um, and in return, they receive a portion of the revenue or a fee for their service. And this is something that we'll tease out a bit later because it's evolving over time. Uh, so just given this definition, the typical functions that are included in OPM partnerships uh, are marketing, student recruitment, enrollment and advising, online curriculum and course design, support, tech, infrastructure, data analytics, student support and advising. 
so those are the more traditional uh, parts of the value chain that OPMs uh, deliver. And functions that are typically out of scope are student admissions decisions, financial aid and awards, which is very, again, US centric, those two, um, uh, instruction, regulatory reporting and compliance. So keep those kind of what's in and what's out ideas or buckets in mind as we're going, because we'll be talking about how that's changing over time. And our book draws from experiences in this space from, I think, about 17 different authors and across North America, Australia, India, Singapore, and Malaysia. So it's kind of fun to think about the OPMs in, in the in the bigger context or the timeline, if you will, of distance and online education. So when we think about distance education beginning over a century and a half ago using tools and, and innovation like the postal service, I think radio is quite popular as well. Um, I have a colleague who also loves to call out um, the fly in, fly out doctors, royal doctors as being a part of this as well. Um, and then in the mid 80s, in the mid 90s, but also in the 80s, teleconferencing came into the scene and that enabled, enabled place, uh, LMS companies in the 90s like Blackboard um, to improve and embed teleconferencing softwares um, into LMSs that they started selling to universities. And I'm just pulling out sentences from, from some of the framing that we did to set this up. Uh, and then the LMS became the primary tool to managing the learning experience of online students, which enabled third party providers to really come into this space um, at pace. And this nuance was key to enabling the emergence of the OPM partnerships in the early 2000s, because essentially uh, they were able to have a space and place to locate and can and deliver the services so they didn't have to be with the university or present with the university so it was an enabling tool to scale the online student to to put a place where student where it's, uh, online student enrollments were being scaled because that was initially i'd say the big uh, ad that opms were delivering to unis and then as they were able to deliver more enrollments, um, the opportunity to increase their remit into different techs and tools to help universities expanded because as we probably all know, it's really hard to make university systems go fast and speak to each other. Uh, so then we're just looking at some numbers. So since uh, 2010, there were nearly 3000 long-term educational partnerships. And this really started to take off specifically for OPMs. And then uh, it became even more, um, there was a spike during COVID globally in the space. And just to show like some numbers to give it context, you know, around 2021, as um, Hull and IQ was tracking educational partnerships yearly, uh, up, it was sitting around half of them were with OPMs specifically. So, um, those of you that work for OPMs might be able to speak to this in more detail, and we go into more detail on this into chapter one, but it's just nice to situate it into a, a longer timeline of, of the past and where we are now, and what this means then for what we found in some of the things that we've read. So um, some additional framing in terms of why would universities partner with an OPM? Um, there's several reasons. Usually uh, it's one of four, lack of in-house function. So partnering can fill gaps and provide expertise quickly when a university lacks a, a specific function internally. Uh, it could be out of a need for additional resourcing or scaling. So the partnerships can manage the risk of resourcing and scaling without overburdening or existing staff or compromising the student experience or interfering with a university's BAU, which is usually considered the face to face offerings. Uh, also for short term goals. So uh, in achieving short term objectives, partnerships can offer quick solutions in that space as well, uh, so that um, over time a university can transition these capabilities in house. Uh, and another reason is to enhance the student experience. So partnerships can improve student outcomes because they can provide better access to the education support um, and employment opportunities often afforded through the sort of technical systems that universities um, 
until today have have struggled to get up and maintain. I'm thinking off the top of my head, CRMs and Salesforce. However, when we look at this holistically, the decision to partner should be made methodically. And, and I think to date, it usually is. And after a deep dive into the ways of doing this, we've landed on two frameworks that have become that have emerged or have been borrowed from other spaces. So I'll hand over to Chin to talk about. Thank you, Don. Uh, so the two framework that we have been researching, we thought it might be you know, useful in considering the relationship between the OPM and university. So the first one, we, we take it from uh, Barney's um, resource-based views framework. So, so this framework focusing on the um, uh, capabilities uh, of both sides of the, of the stories, the university capabilities, as well as on the uh, OPM, um, you know, offering uh, services, you know, uh, to service the market and the kind of the right and a conscious plan of the uh, required, you know, services when we're looking at the Barney models. So the second model, which is we we found it very useful as well, which is the Holon IQ 2020 Higher Education Digital Capability Framework. So we're looking at the 16 um, dimensions of these particular capabilities, um, particularly, you know, from the, you know, from the uh, demand side, as well as from the supply side as well. And we're trying to merge these two together. So in other words, by doing that, we'll be able to find a right balance, you know, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of servicing the market and meeting the capability of, you know, of the, um, you know, of the, of the um, university. So here is the more details of the Barney's models in here. So looking at the VRIO uh, particular dimension. So values, what do OPMs, you know, provide to their university to their customers to their audio colleges uh you know training institutions rarity you know what capability do opm possess that university lack uh dimension number three is the immutability so what capability are essential for university but challenging and or costly uh to acquire you know for immediate use um you know short term and long term um, and for number four, which is organization, do university have the necessary structure to support and maintain uh, this capability? Um, so thank you, Don. And the second framework, which is the Holland IQ framework. So you can see the 16 dimensions aspects in here as well, where Holland was basically looking at the program design development. They got four. Uh, prescriptions or a, a sub dimensions in there uh, from course learning design to faculty engagement and support creating digital courseware and instructional strategies um, and you can see over there on the right hand side the assessment so so the university or customer you can call it they have to do their in-house assessment of where they are you know in terms of those uh, sub um in there and have to be really truthful on that uh, the, the second dimension is student information and learning environments, where you're looking at marketing and recruitment uh, technologies, learning environmental environment tools, anal analytics, uh, insight and dashboard, uh, technology hosting and integration. So you have to mark, you know, university or the customer have to, you know, assess themselves on that. The third dimension is the uh, marketing and enrollment services. So we're looking at market demand analysis, marketing services, lead generations and conversion, and enrollment um, management. Right. So, so these capabilities you can see you can move down the, the ranks program delivery and student success as well. Looking at learning and delivery, uh, student retention, success, and faculty support. So, so university can look at that, and also OPM also looking at that as well, and they try to. You know they try to uh, match each others in um, in this model. Thank you, Don. So we have came up and researched and came up with these uh, ten approaches uh, for OPM and and universities um, relationships or partnerships. So this is our first more chapters of the book, um, and as you can enjoy, I think you can download it for now. You know on on the uh, Rouchnet, um, Taylor and Francis link as well. 
So the traditional, we're looking at the supply side of the OPM approaches. So we're looking at the OPM side of things. So, you know, what are the key um, models that have been running? So you can see over there the OPM traditional revenue models, right, between university and OPM, where the revenue generated, you know, from the online uh, program and their share between university and the OPM, you know, themselves. And that could be anything from business development, program development, marketing, uh, recruitment, student support, technological, you know, infrastructures. Number two is fee for a service. So obviously this one is more a, a la carte kind of model where, you know, you can speak and choose, you know, things that you can support uh, the customer on the university side. The third one, which is the marketplace model. So this one is particularly looking at uh, places like Coursera, for example, edX, where they build a platform for online delivery for all kind of courses for multiple kind of customers. You know, in there, they brought together the learners, the employers, the educational content, providing a, a range of the access, actually, of courses um, and in, in a lot of subject area. And number four, we're looking at white labeling, where uh, OBM will be partnering a university uh, to deliver you know, those online education program and experiences, experiences, you know, in the university brand themselves. So basically students will, you know, study at university or study at any program they don't know that, you know, that's been running by, um, you know, a particular, you know, OPM. Um, the other six um, approaches that we have uh, found out is, we, we label it as e emergent demand side of uh, the equations there. So, and number one with that side will be on scale up and scale out for the OPM. As you can see that, you know, uh, OPM can be very flexible in the market and anything that float their boat, they will be able to, you know, to run with it. They, they expanding it, scale up or out, which means they sell it to another equity providers or another partners, for example. Um, Buy and buy an OBM and bring in, bring it in house. So that's a lot of university have been, you know, doing that um, as well. So example, that would be New Hampshire University, for example. They uh, acquire our LRNG, which is an OBM focusing on the workforce development. And in 2019, they brought them over uh, into uh, their in house. So um, strategy number three there is transform an OBM to an online program um, enabler. So this is particularly uh, for the OPM uh, themselves. So this shift, as you can see, the transition from the role of the company that we're focusing on the OPM traditionally to now enable uh, client, a client, the university, you know, with online offering. And number four, it has strategy to become, to remain as an OPM, which is not changing. And number five, which is a mix between OPM services to fully online and high flex um you know uh, activities in there so here is for university as well as for opm as you can see they're moving from the previous you know pandemic online delivery to now becoming a lot more um you know a lot more hybrid a lot more in the in the face-to-face -face, uh teaching delivery residential delivery you know all sort of thing in there and number six is the coupling for, for which is a di1 strategy you know for the university where they start you know do it themselves um and not depending on the OPM as such because they have grown in terms of capabilities and a lot more experience has been built throughout the pandemic. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Can you move? Uh, so just uh, answering Colin's question. So buying an OPM, does this mean that the OPM staff just become permanent university staff? So when we were writing this, it was actually a really turbulent time. Like we'd wake up one morning and an OPM would change hands. We'd wake up next week and, and a university in the US would be questioned about funding. So they'd just buy the OPM and bring it in house. So what happened to the staff in some instances, we believe they did, but I don't think that we ever dug much deeper into what happened to the staff. Did we, Chin? We we haven't actually dug further down onto the staff itself, but normally within, you know, all of this happening and, you know, scale up or scale out, there are things that are happening to the staff members as well. And you can read a lot of those in the, particularly in the US um, newspaper, 
where they'll be retrenched, they'll be informed that they're out of work, you know, the next day, for example, things like that. Um, I think my was it I was it the University of Arizona? I can't remember, but like the government gave them a request for information and their response was just to buy the OPM. Do you remember if that was Arizona? I can't remember, but it was really uh, fun to read for a while. It was a bit of a soap opera for about a good solid month because there was a Senate there was a Senate inquiry going on where um the US government was looking into when the when the government was giving money towards admissions, was that going to the OPM, whereas the government had intended for it to go to the university, those sorts of things. Um, and when they tried to shut it down, I, it, the realization was that um, the university still didn't have the capability to do a lot of what OPMs were doing. So the government came in hard and then had to back off um, probably equally as hard. <laughs> Uh, so if we moving in then with all of this in mind, we had key chapters in our books uh, specific to learning design. So I think we there were 13 chapters in total. We have six that either focused on learning design or mentioned learning design. Uh, so I would say call out um, six, seven, eight, and nine were learning design centric, whereas chapter four and 10 offer interesting insights into in, in interactions with staff. So I guess because learning design is, you know, a, you have to engage with academic staff to do the work and make it happen. Um, four and 10 are also useful insights into how OPM and universities reached uh, a point of shared understanding, language, and trust. Um, and uh, chapter 10 really captures uh, staff voice. So there were quite a few interviews done on the outcomes at, I believe it was UNSW. Um, whereas the other ones uh, speak to uh, the six uh, squeak. We asked all of the authors to speak really candidly and honestly about what didn't work and what did work. Uh, and I think that uh, Stephen and Iman's uh, chapters do that really well. And then um, we looked at ways that we can assess that um, universities and OPMs can assess capabilities to help make those decisions that we saw in the two different frameworks. Um, and then looking at ways that universities and OPMs can QA each other. And what we found then some overall findings, which I don't think will surprise you, but but they're worth considering and thinking about. Um, one is perceptions of quality. So the farther the learning design function is from the academic discipline or university setting, the greater the scrutiny and mistrust it faces, which makes the role increasingly challenging. As, as I imagine, if you're in, in the role, you can imagine even how that plays out locally at a university between central units and, and, and faculties. And then when you send, um, an OPM representative in, I would say it, what we found is, is that it, it increases that even more. Whoops. Um, the next one is about quality and assurance. Because of the perceptions of quality being greater, the OPM learning design systems um, are only as successful as the QA capability that exists between the OPM and the university, um, which needs a partnership approach to quality assurance. Uh, in instances where the partnership approach didn't exist or had to be built over time. You can really hear come out in, in the different case studies how painful that was for staff and how hard it was to recover from the early days when it didn't exist. And that's not a critique. If you think of, you know, it's about why, why universities are partnering with OPMs and it's to move faster or to plug capability gaps and all that's wrapped up into, into what we're talking about here and plays out in in confrontational ways. Uh, learning designs, uh, the learning design professional slash academic identity. Uh, we're being quite provocative with this one, but the ongoing debate about shared capability standards and work approaches starts to influence whether learning design as a function is perceived as easy or difficult to outsource to an OPM. And we're not, we're not going to say it's easy or difficult. It's how well the university knows their function and how well an OPM knows their 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 functions, capabilities, et cetera. Like you can't really make the decisions without that knowing. And as and there's so much debate at the moment around what it means. 
that um, without those sorts of unified understanding, how do you assess how do you assess the role? How do you assess the teams? And how how then does that play out in the decision making that learning design would be the function that you would or wouldn't give to the OPM? Um, organizational change and capability gaps. So OPM learning designers are at the forefront of driving cultural change um, as their engagement highlights the capability gap within the university. So I think sometimes um, uh, um, that plays out in different ways. I think Stephen Ablett, your, your um, chapter in particular um, speaks to this point and um, the different ways that we can support learning designers who are in that in that space is, is really a challenge to probably the whole sector. Uh, decoupling and unbundling. So when it came to that moment where uh, universities could start only outsourcing pieces instead of the whole value chain, or it was time to like maybe term sheets were up and it was time to bring things back in house. Learning design functions were usually the first cab off the rank to take back from OPM partnerships, um, which makes sense because often that space is entangled with uh, academic uh, content. And uh, the one of the big, big ones that was called out across the book is the concept of academic workload. Um, no one's quite gotten that right. The time commitment's a, a huge pain point and dependent upon critical engagement points, shared goals, shared language and expectation setting. And oftentimes when um, the partnerships are brought in, it's to move fast. So um, those shared goals and expectation setting um, are built along the way as opposed to uh, stated up front. And again, it's something that plays out in, in different ways, often quite challenging. So those would be the six consistent findings really across the book. Um, and you could even see it in other spaces, not just learning design, same sort of um, conversations happening and struggles. But it's actually really exciting what OPMs have also done for, for learning design and other, and other areas of the university. And we've just taken a moment to kind of think about the future scope for this. And um, we were thinking then in terms of looking forward, um, learning designs, because it's so much more well-known and popular and, uh, now, having worked with OPMs, there are other uh, companies and entities trying to set up OPM-like models without being an OPM. So that first example, learning design as an enabler for project and business strategy, where subject matter expertise hubs, so like um, specialist hubs are becoming centers that design and sell courses for specialist sectors. And for hubs that are dependent on funding, that becomes an important or useful revenue stream for them. Um, the diversification of learning design capabilities across sectors. So there's a rise of business partner roles in banks and of, uh, I think mining is another one that we saw in learning and development spaces where they're using learning designers almost like an internal sales function to try and push employee development and organizational growth and change. And then another uh, future consideration is increases in, increases in learning designers on the market changes the decision making process for what to buy, sell and protect. Um, when we think about whether you're going to outsource or not or partner or not, um, now that there are so many more learning designers uh, uh, present, the people are using that to insource and we're seeing learning design specialists and private companies now being paid a salary to design tailored lifelong learning solutions as opposed to buying off the shelf products or um, going to universities to buy off the shelf products. Um, Chin, did you have any any more that you wanted to add to that? Oh, thank you, Don. I think I see more of that. So if you go to, um, it's very simple, sick.com.au and you just type in, you know, learning designers, for example, and you will see the multiple opportunity, you know, for learning designers in there. And what, is, what else that means is that there's multiple verification of OPM or OPM-like operation or OPE, online program enablers, happening across the board, not just in education. You know, it's in aviation, you know, it's in transportation, it's in mining, it's in knowledge, uh, industry, heavily industry. A lot of these opportunities, I think I agree with you, uh, Dawn, in terms of, you know, it becoming 
an enabler for, for business strategies, for change, for people and capability and, and development and internal sales, you know, as well. A lot of this happening and it's also for my my, my personal, you know, connections in working in those areas where people moving jobs from one place to another, from to another, from education to industry, you know, to buying to other sectors as well. So there's a multiple opportunities for, for learning design in that space. Thank you, Don. But I, I, and we think it's kind of fun to see the 10 approaches now kind of moving across to anywhere really this would be our take home message. Uh, and that was, sorry, that was it from us. We'll hand it over for questions. And um, I think that's the link as well to the book. It was reviewed by Jilly Sammons and Neil Mosley, who gave positive reviews. You can go read for yourself. Mm. And um, call out again to Stephen Ablett, who I saw in the room, who contributed a chapter. Um, and many other people, I think, from this community are also in the book. So, um, yeah, feel free to have a look, download, tell us what you think. We're open to feedback. And, and I will also got a forward from Phil Hill as well, who is... Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we've mentioned uh thank you so much um Dawn and Chin that was terrific and uh there's heaps of time for questions so could I just ask um everyone who's joined us today to feel free please to just um call out some form of applause whether that's in the chat or using your emojis um and if you do have just to thank our presenters for what has been a really interesting wrap up of what's happening in the space um, and if you do have questions you're more than welcome to put your hand up um, if you want to use your microphone or put a, a question in the chat and we can either um, read it out on your behalf or throw to you if um, you prefer to, to speak that um, I'm guessing Craig, you might have um, a question because you've put your mic yeah. on. Did you have a question? Yeah, it's sort of, sort of a question, I suppose. But, but Dawn, like you sort of hinted at this, but you know, if there's a difference between, say, learning design that's done in universities and done in OPMs, I've worked in both, and I actually I work in an OPM now at, at, at Wiley. But I, I sort of, I suppose, you know, we're heavily templated. We have our templates checked by universities, and I sort of. The, the ideas that I participate in are probably not that much different <laughs> than if I was in a university. But did you did, did you discover any sort of differences, do you think, between OPM approaches and university approaches? Well, I think, I, I think one of the key differences is that OPMs are usually there to deliver fully online learning. And yeah. university's goal is actually the exact opposite of that. Um, so as a result of delivering fully online learning, there is more structure to the learning design. It's usually a learning design system and have, and, um, they're usually, they're more often than not accelerated non-traditional sort of, um, like weeks. So rarely are, are OPMs delivering a 12 week model. It's usually, you know, six, 10, eight. Um, so any sort of system or consistent design that you can put around that helps students cognitive load which might be why, you know, uh, Colin's comment about OPMs being able to drive higher student satisfaction. I think they also, and Stephen Ablett could probably speak to this more than me because of how long he's worked at KeyPath but, and Chin at Curio. Um, but I think that um, they can they can bring in some consistencies in the way that you can get academics to do on campus. Yeah. Um, and yeah, some of that is driven by uh, contracts that you also can't, contracts with KPIs that you also can't do on campus with academics. So I think that there's a lot of things at play that help to differentiate that. Like at our MIT online, we had uh, all sorts of shared KPIs with our OPM and different providers, and that helped with shared goals. Um, it helped us to iterate faster to get to points of satisfaction and quality. And these conversations are uncomfortable inside the academy. Uh, and th they often are received with uh, much more pushback. Yeah. Steve or Chin, did either of you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. Uh, thank you, Greg, for your, for your observation, I would say. Um, it what we because my I got about you know some years experiences at a professional firm education firm 
with uh, you know learning designs and education consulting and online teaching, you know areas as well. So, um, you know we got works uh from the university and most of the time with a very very tight timeline and 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 with you know <laughs> with a consulting firm extra you know outside of the university they tend to work faster more heavily templated um but now i'm sitting on the other side of <laughs> um of a of a consulting firm so i see the feedback that that we have from a, an outsider provider seems to be uh less creative tend to be too much templated uh you know not so much um creative creativity uh, or different kind of activities being built woven woven into the um into the lesson um yeah and and it could be clunky at some point because all of these um you know product can be you know uploaded to different kind of lms system um and, and that would drive the student experience in a different way um as well so so that's what i have found great Stephen, did you want to add something as well yeah, I, I think from my perspective, it's it's the specialization in learning design, yes, but it's it's really the targeting of specific programs and the resourcing the the learning design workloads and the actual money that we can put behind the programs that universities usually can't do in a targeted way. I think that's you know we for example would spend let's say um, it varies by partner, but let's say 200 hours of learning design work to produce a six week accelerated course alongside, you know, 150 hours of academic work and various other supporters around sort of ed tech and web development and, and other bits and pieces, project management, which is really resource intensive in a way that a lot of, from my experience, a lot of university teams aren't just set up to do that intense work i think that's probably the strength of the opm learning design function and i think you see that as as colin said in the sort of um uh yeah student satisfaction scores and retention rates and the things that they're, they're um, surprisingly quite good for online learning in a lot of opm contexts i think colin you had a your hand up do you want to ask a question or provide a comment <laughs> i'm not sure if i have a question or just a bunch of thoughts orbiting around my brain um but hopefully they'll all kind of make sense in some way um can you hear me okay okay good um yeah no i i i i haven't worked at an opm but i've known a lot of people who have and i've had a great interest in this sector because i think it really is fascinating one of my earliest exposures when I was was when I was working at Swinburne and someone kind of pointed out that the student satisfaction scores for Swinburne online were about 10 points higher than for Swinburne courses, which basically had the net result of dragging Swinburne score up. So people were quite happy about that. But there's a couple of really interesting points to do with OPMs. One is that they tend to, you know, <sighs> To say cherry pick is not quite right because it's a strategic decision, but the courses that often get seem to get delivered through OPMs are smaller cohorts and, you know, sort of <clears throat> potentially more appealing units. And I think particularly having the smaller cohort and, you know, services like OES or whatever have this kind of you know 24 7 model of support where a student can contact anyone for help at 3 a.m in the morning which universities obviously are just not capable of supporting at that kind of scale um and universities are also you know the the less online courses you know you're potentially looking at 1500 people and again it's it's basically impossible to get that level of quality or that kind of model with that kind of cohort of students. I told you I didn't quite know where I was going, but um, there are a whole bunch of thoughts here. Um, I guess what I, to, to bring it back to a question, I, I think that the, the quality thing does seem to partially hinge on the smaller cohorts and that degree of support. 
that is provided and also possibly the templating like and Chin sort of just mentioned that um, one of the criticisms of OPM courses is that they can be a little bit more cookie cutter because your OPMs have tended to work out a very specific way of building courses which work for them and they will apply that across the board. Um, and the academics have a lot less control or a lot less academic freedom. And, you know, I, I have feelings about academic freedom anyway, um, which mean that, you know, um, the students do get a more consistent approach. Was in the book, did you sort of dive into these kind of differences between the, the learning design experiences in those courses versus the regular units? Because it's very rare that a university didn't have a learning design unit already in operation when they brought in OPMs. Uh, <laughs> no, we, did, we didn't seek to compare internal and external OPM teams, if, if that's what you mean. It's just no, nobody su suggested doing that. Um, but I think um, I don't. I don't think it's a cookie cutter approach. I think it's a systematic approach. Uh, I think it's been systematized to to help online students learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in terms of like, if you think about the small cohort argument, um, like Stephen spoke to the number of hours that OPMs are willing to put behind it. And when you think about those hours and the and the hours of the academic, you actually have to be able to say that you can get enough students to cover. To, to warrant that investment. So it's very rare that an OPM and a university partnership would chase small cohorts. It's more demand led in that the OPM does significant market research on how, how, how many enrollments would be available should the course go forward? Um, would they be generating new enrollments? Would they be taken from other universities? It's interrogated at the front end uh, like, you know, 98% more than when a university decides to put up a course. Um, and particularly in online spaces, I think universities put up courses that are often a coalition of the willing. Um, and when OPMs are selecting courses, it's it's um, that demand led doesn't mean that you're going to land on on um, a coalition of the willing. Uh, so I think what they do do with small cohorts is often um, there are like in the delivery, it's small class sizes or smaller sections in Canvas. Um, but a lot of universities are using small tutorials anyway, but yeah, neither here nor there. Um, but Chin, Stephen, do you want to speak to any of those points or comment more on the difference between OPM team and an in-house uni team? definitely a point of consternation in keep up at the moment because increasingly universities are um, taking that learning design function back in-house uh, uh, and I, I guess we have examples of going the other way as well where they sort of take it back and then realize over 18 months that that they don't want to do it anymore for various reasons I, I think that that sort of is happening as well at a couple of our partners at the moment I think it works both ways and I think sometimes it, learning design can be quite opaque and uh, it can be hard to see um, the work that goes into it and and that means that that you know one of our partners for example thinks they could just you know take it back and and produce a whole bunch of courses for a master's of I think it was um I'm not going to say what it was um, I don't want to identify them um and then realize over 18 months that we can't do this to the standard that the partner was doing to the standard the OPM was doing, even though, you know, um, you know, we weren't happy with the quality of the work. I, I think there are those sorts of ongoing challenges around setting expectations. One of the big challenges with Key Path is setting expectations really, really high and not being able to to meet them at all. Um, but then, you know, not necessarily being enabled through the partnership to address a lot of the issues that are causing the strain. So those issues that I talk about in the book chapter around, um you know, workload in particular for academic staff, but professional development and and general sort of willingness um, and mindsets to actually be involved in the, the OPM and the online space from a lot of academic staff. I think, you know, when we go into a partnership, you know, yes, it is very market driven, but for us, it's also, you know, does the university actually have the academic capabilities to deliver the program? And then 
are they actually willing? Because we've gone into partnerships where the faculty are sort of being dragged into the program because there's a big demand for it and the university wants it and we want it, but it just becomes an absolute disaster because you've got unwilling faculty not uh, not wanting to engage with the process. So I think you have to be very strategic in in not just looking at where the market demand is, but looking at both the, the OPM and the uh, university capabilities as well and willingness. Can I jump in here? David. Oh, sorry. Go, Chin, um, did you have something else to add? And then we might kind of need to start wrapping up some closing thoughts around it. Sure. Uh, just a very quick thought, you know, in relation to what Collins has, has shared before, but, you know, the OPM, um, you know, uh, satisfaction result seems to be higher than the uh, the normal university courses. Because I was at a, an OPM before, uh, and I thought, you know, with the university as well. But what I've found, you know, every single teaching period, you know, they run about six teaching periods per year, you know, back to back, everything is two months. Um, and the teaching, the teaching satisfaction index is actually always higher than the than the course content or the learning designs um, satisfaction. It's always like that. Uh, the gap can be a bit smaller over time, over the years, but still higher, the teaching part is still higher. So it actually signifies that the student support that getting all of these higher, you know, highly, um, highly busy, uh, time poor, you know, workloads, you know, and also high, high, you know, high workload as well, uh, to get them to work, to get them to study and complete a, a course, you know, you need a lot of student support in there. And, and, and that demonstrate and that actually come in you know, in another way, in terms of the numbers of the student satisfaction result, whereas the design aspect of it tend to be forgotten uh, or not being reflected more on that, you know, on that respect. And it's also, it all depends on how long you, you know, how often and how long and how often do you refresh the course material as well? Because students are also complaining about some of the readings, some of the examples, some of the content tend to be a bit lagging in terms of the practice. That's for me. Great. Oh, there's so many things that I would love to <laughs> ask and add in this conversation. Um, I guess uh, you, just wrapping up because I'm conscious of time, um, are there any kind of key takeaways that you feel, um, Jin or Dawn, uh, in terms of either that you think would be great for institutions who are coming into that kind of partnership to be aware of or things that you feel would be great for learning designers who are moving across spaces to be aware of. Um, just any key takeaways or messages that you feel would be great to add that haven't, you know, that maybe you want to reiterate or, or bring up. I think it's in, it's an incredibly varied space. So, um, uh, like, it and it'll be different even with the same OPM. It's it'll be different with every single school and faculty within the same university. Um, which is one of the fun things about higher education. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I think moving across spaces is is good. Uh, I think that there's opportunities to learn a lot from the way OPMs operate and design. And if the more people that can move across those spaces and bring that back into universities, then the less universities will have to partner. Uh, I think that would take decades to achieve, but I think that's kind of what we're seeing now. And it's what we've been seeing happen over from that supply side to the emergent side as well, because universities are able to be a bit pickier about the contracts, the pricing, the, the term sheets, because some of that capability has been built over the last 20 years. Um, so my closing thought, Chin. Well, I uh, thank you, Don. I think from my side, I feel that there is a uh, capability, um, engagement, and development up, you know, upgrades in terms of the the staff member, for example, uh, and the skill upgrade as well, which is very important for for university side. Um, and again, this is a very, very uh, varied experiences. Um, yeah. And if you can you can put a lot of flavor, you can put a lot of um, you know practical experiences. It's different, you know. It's a different experience if you a university team up with other 
OPM with a non-OPM and you move the different kind of model, which is making the areas very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think the two side, you know, trying to solve a problem, right? Um, and, um, and the problem will be a bit less if they uh, work more to, you know, to, to deliver. That's from me. Thank you so much. So um, I'm just going to ask everyone to again thank our two presenters today, Chin, Chin Nguyen and Dawn Gilmore, um, who have offered some um, great um, some great perceptions and um, insights into the partnerships and the landscape around uh, higher ed, pub, uh, well, typically public, but sometimes private institutions and OPMs in the space and what that means for learning design. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, at this point, just throw it over to my uh, colleague uh, and amazing uh, friend, Kashmira, to just let us know what's happening for next month's webinar with the Learning Design SIG. Um, but if you could put a pause in the chat um, and also Dawn and Chin, if you if there are ways that people could reach out to you if they have any further questions or um, if you're happy for us to kind of pass things on, let us know. Um, but I'll pass over to Kashmira. She's going to let us know about other LDC events. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kate. So um, if you attended uh, like uh, last month's webinar, you know that uh, we have been talking about uh, partnership, um, digital um, critical student partnership uh, uh, in learning design model for uh, and Seb uh, Dianati was uh, talking about it. So we got a lot of feedback around um, they want kind of like not touching but more extended version of that presentation. So um, we uh, invited him to do part two of that, uh, which is going to happen uh, next month. So what he will be presenting is just following um, on this. So uh, he will be uh, talking more about um, um, First Nations uh, uh, students and how to develop partnership with the um, Indigenous students in the in the university. Because I mean, as as we can imagine, like is Charles Darwin University sits in um, you know indigenous land, so they have uh, more of the students. So we will be talking about that and and some more around uh, uh, the university's uh, desktop uh, review that he, he did around uh, frameworks and uh, teaching and learning initiatives that other universities have have been doing. So that that will be for next um, month. So I hope to see you there. That will be third Friday at 12. Um, thank you, Kashira. And I'll also put um, a link in the chat for the Australian Association of Learning Designers. So if you do want to stay up to date with uh, posts around the learning design, SIG, um, that's the best place to go, the LinkedIn group in there. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a link in the chat if you do want to stay on top of um, what's happening in the space and any of the upcoming events. So um, thank you again to both our presenters and to all the amazing questions and additional comments from um, people like Craig, Stephen, Colin, others in the space. Um, it's been a really great um, discussion that's been happening. So and it's obviously quite a topical subject at the moment. Um, just a note that Colin's put a note around the televisors webinar and I will just reiterate the link to uh, Dawn and Chin's book just in case you do want to go and check that one out or purchase it. Um, that's now in the chat as well. So thank you again, everyone, and hopefully we get to see you uh, virtually next month.